So Norman, you've been involved in lots of different projects all over the city. Your main forte is kind of bikes and the freewheel north. Yeah. And you seem to have a pretty principled life about, you know, understanding things in community. And you seem to be able to turn your hand to lots of different things, which in a way is probably what's kept you going for so long, because you've been doing this stuff for quite a long time. And uh, so just, I'd like to start off just by asking you a bit about your background, where you were born, mm -hmm. you know, was your parents any influence in what you do nowadays, or just a wee bit of your background? Uh, well, I was born in Bolton, which is now part of Greater Manchester, and my dad was a miner, and it's always hard to know, you know, what influences go into the makeup of your own character. But I think, you know, from a working class mining background, I think there's already a sense of, you know, a need for social justice, just, just kind of in the atmosphere. I think that's driven me all my life. So I, I left school early and I was destined for a, a career in factory work not necessarily the mine, because the mines were already closing down then, but just a conventional working class uh, kind of manual labour background I was destined for. And that's the way I was going, leaving school early. But I had, had a kind of a epiphany experience in my early 20s, thinking, you know, there's got to be something more than this. And I think that, that feeling combined with a feeling for the need for social justice drove me in a different direction. And one day, I was working in a factory in Manchester, and one day I just walked out and never returned because <laughs> I just felt, you know, there was something more. And this was a period, you know, of early Thatcherism when there was a lot going on, a lot of social dining, there was a lot of protest against kind of social injustices that were going on. So I what felt... What year would that be in? That would be the early 80s, early 80s. So I, I walked out of a a job in a plastics factory, you know, which in another scenario could have been a career for me, but it's not something I wanted to do. It was not something I was particularly interested in. I knew I wanted to do something connected with social justice or philosophy or politics or activism or something, something more than just drudging to the factory every day and slaving this away. Just before the main strike. Yeah, it was somewhat before that, yeah. It was a, a couple of years before that. So I walked out of my job and I started going to lots of evening classes, a random range of evening classes. At that time, there was a great institution called the Manchester School of Adult Education. And they did classes in everything from Spanish to piano to philosophy. And I tried a whole bunch of different classes. Having left school with hardly any qualifications previously, and I think that was the start of you know, my alternative education. And that led to me, a few years later, doing a course, in, uh, doing some A-levels, including philosophy. I think that was a key experience for me. That just came into existence at that time. A-level philosophy never existed before that time. I did it. And then I was kind of on a trajectory towards being an academic from thenceforward. Well, I thought I was. It didn't turned out like that, but at the time, I thought I was going to be an academic, a lecturer in philosophy or something, because I did the A-level, I did another A-level, that was music, which was another passion of mine, and then I went on to Warwick University, where I did a degree in philosophy, and then I went on to York University to do a degree in philosophy and psychology and phenomenology, <laughs> and I went to Sussex University to do a degree in artificial intelligence and philosophy, and then eventually I came to Glasgow to do a PhD in the philosophy of economics. <laughs> now, it took me a long time to realise that academia was, you know, as conservative and reactionary and resistant to change as anything else in society. I've come to realise that institutions such as universities were there largely to keep things the same. I mean, it strikes me as comical now. You, you go to Glasgow University, they've got a big slogan, world changes, welcome. <laughs> There's no truth in that whatsoever. If you want to change the world, you've got to get in, engaged in social community action. That's the way to change the world, not to go into these institutions 
whose very purpose it is to support you know, multinational corporations and big profits who obviously support financially universities through governments, or directly and indirectly. I suppose that background does kind of set you up in some ways. It you. did. It, you know, there's a lot to be said, although I became ultimately disillusioned with academia. I learned a lot, and there was a lot of good stuff in it as well. It's a bit like Radio 4. Mm -hmm. You know, Radio 4 is an establishment organisation. Its main purpose is to support things as they are now, but you get a lot of dissenting voices, a lot of interesting radical arguments at the same time. The two are mixed together. You know, life is never simple. And so I learned a lot by doing philosophy. And still now, my main thing when I'm arguing for, for making the world healthier, safer, more attractive, is using logic and science that I've learned in my academic career. So what kind of things did you get involved in? You know, when you became more aware that you'd maybe be wanting to do in something? Uh, the environment was always the main thing. When I was still doing my PhD at Glasgow University, I was also getting involved in what used to be called the Environment Centre, which was, uh, oh, I think it was sometimes called Centre 21, which was an organisation of volunteers in a building by the Clyde. And it was supposed to be a kind of environmental advice and research centre. And I, I was nominally the librarian there. It was an okay kind of project, but the main thing, it was, it was a good focus and a hub for lots of other different projects that were going on. So if you wanted to know what's going on in Glasgow, a, a, a growing project, a cycling project, a food project, information about all those projects was in one place. What it? it? Its funding ended, it stopped, and eventually the building was knocked down, you know. but. That again, I can see how that influenced me and the, what I'm doing here in the White House now is another kind of community information environmental project, you know, centre. Hopefully... So you decided after that kind of academic yeah. life, yeah. thinking that you have to do some practical stuff, yeah. what is it, praxis, whatever Yeah. call it, an academic life. Yeah, uh, you know... So what, what did you do? What did you start doing? Well, after the centre won, I uh, started working as a volunteer for a mental health uh, cycle recycling charity. And I worked there for seven years. I was a full-time volunteer for about two years, but I learned the skills to raise money for charities while I was in there. So I was instrumental in, in a sense in creating my own position and that of other people. And the project grew while I was there and I had more branches, but eventually, I kind of wanted to do something even more. I was especially interested in the rights of disabled people and their ability or not to access the environment. Mm -hmm. and when people talk about disabled access rights, it's often, they're often thinking about uh, public transport, buildings, hotels, but I'm interested in people accessing the outdoor environment, whether that's in an urban environment or the countryside. Because there's no one more uh, oppressed by the physical constraints of our environment and its domination by cars than disabled people. Yes. I mean, it's interesting, lots, you know, in parks and different places, when they decide to do away with green space, a lot of the time the argument they use is nobody uses it. Yeah. You know, the thing is, the argument I always make is, is but what about people in wheelchairs mm -hmm. and stuff? You know, who can't run about mad in the park and stuff, but they enjoy seeing it, they enjoy the vistas, and they enjoy yeah. watching other people. You yeah. know, they enjoy the space itself, even if nothing's happening in it, which is, that, that doesn't really go into the Richter scale, really. No. It's given a really low priority, and I've had a, you know, a tremendous struggle trying to get any councillor or politician interested in the same issues I'm interested in. It's kind of so far below the radar, yeah, which is paradoxical and ironic when you think about it, because it's obviously one of the most important things. You know, it combines so many things in one. The environment, health, society, loneliness and isolation, mm -hmm. uh, lack of physical activity, obesity, all these issues come together in the design of urban space. And that's what I've become primarily interested in now, 
have the physical space between buildings, mm -hmm. that free open space or space that should be free and open is actually closed and we're isolated in tiny pockets surrounded by barriers and traffic that keeps us separated from each other. Yeah, one of the things I was thinking about in terms of this project is talking about things like architecture as a social subject. Yeah. I mean, it's always a professionalised subject or academic or whatever. But people live in buildings most of their lives. Yeah. Usually know very little about them. Yeah. So how do you have an analysis on your environment? Yeah. What developers are doing and gentrification and things like that. Yeah. If you don't have any of these basic notions. Yeah. Uh, planning and architecture and stuff. Yeah, the thing is, you know, in terms of social architecture, that is concentrating on the space between buildings rather than buildings themselves. Great work is being done throughout the world, you know. There are some great people doing great work. Jan Gell, based in Copenhagen, is probably the world's leaders, leading practitioner on development of quality urban space for human beings and recognising the fact that, you know, lost something. In the 20th century, we've lost something. We've lost the essence of childhood. Childhood requires space <laughs> for children. And that space is, is not necessarily palming your children off to a sports centre or to an event or a special location where children may play. But the fact, even going back to our childhoods, you know, not that long ago, historically, you know, the street where we lived was the main focus and centre of community activity. Children playing on the street, grannies sitting on the doorstep, corner shops, pubs, post offices, all the fabric uh, of local society. And that has all, all been consciously removed by the motor industry in the 20th century. And Glasgow has come worse off than almost anywhere in that respect. All the squares and crosses, have been eliminated, you know, and, and consequently all the functions that went on in those squares and crosses have been eliminated too. So what do you think are the main sort of barriers? I mean, you know, you've got Norway, I think it was Norway who decided to get rid of capitalist education, education of the banks, and will develop the child as a whole person. Yeah. Which now, academically, they're top-notch. Mm -hmm. you know, so why are we not using that, yeah. that model? Yeah. 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 This idea of the critical connections, mm. you talked about this, mm. things happening all over the world, mm. and you're thinking, but why are we not learning more? I mean, I it's think, a good question. Well, part of the question is because people don't do what you do in lots of ways. It's a slow process, it's a committed process, and it involves deep community engagement, and in a kind of longer term, so people, people are sort of like a, they're really engaged in this process. I think it's about process, how you can do it, how you can, and nobody's kind of doing the dishes. Mm -hmm. you know, nobody's sort of going, so what do we need to do here? And yeah, it's, it. well. And a lot of it's kind of boring. And mm -hmm. a lot of it's kind of, mm -hmm. So it's the idea about how do you make the boring mm -hmm. stuff interesting, and it's not going to happen the next day. What, what do you see as being, part of the main kind of problems about that idea. I mean, it is a different time, a different dynamic when you were growing up than it is just now. Yeah. And it's a lot of stuff that we don't really understand either because we're not really in that experience. Yeah. I'm thinking about what could young people get out of uh, our experience? Well, I think uh, the, the examples you mentioned, Scandinavia, you know, I've got to ask a question, why Scandin Scandinavian countries, why are they so much more enlightened than us in every way, on well, many ways? And, you know, in particular, uh, their childhood is more respected as being of something of value in itself. And children in those countries, they don't start formal schooling until much later because they recognise the value of play. There's something of a puritanical work ethic in this country that suggests you've got to get people prepared for a lifetime of pointless drudgery as soon as possible. So getting them, in, getting them into school and getting them to accept the authority of, you know, an authority figure at the head of the school, getting used to, you know, timetables and strictness and uh, learning by rote, these are all things that are very 
popular in the tropes of British education and the Scandinavian way of looking at things is far more open and free. And it's something to do with the way we, the misperception of risk in our society. We keep, people say we put our children, we surround our children with cotton wool because we're risk averse. I don't that's, I think that's quite the right way of looking at it. It's not that we're risk averse, it's that we, we have no scientific understanding of risk. We are actually in danger if we don't equip children with the ability to play out, simply play out and climb trees and throw snowballs and have the opportunity to do that by having more, more childhood, <laughs> uh, then we, we're subjecting our children to high levels of risk in that they don't develop properly. Mm -hmm. And you see this happening. And this has been exacerbated by you know, smartphones and iPads and huddles. So children literally huddling around a screen when they should be learning those primary psychomotor skills to develop their personality and their body. So children, this, the factor of getting children too much involved in conventional education and that being reinforced by modern technologies taking away childhood, the streets not being safe for children to play on, all these factors are conspiring to deprive children of the childhood. So we have to use, you know, this idea about uh, the nutrients, you know, mm -hmm. how do we collect the nutrients, how do we use the things in our community that's readily available to us? Yeah. So the question is how to get you know, people doing things and getting engaged in the communities, getting them actually active. Uh, well, the, some projects do have difficulty engaging people, but I think we've been very lucky at Free Wheel North, especially the Glasgow Green Centre. Um, we've got a, you know, a section of Glasgow Green there, and we, we pr provide activity for for disabled people and for community groups and school groups and individuals, anyone can come along, have a shot on a bike. And there's a huge variety of bikes we've got there of all kinds, from tricycles to BMXs to the multi-person seven-seater conference bike. And it's incredibly popular and successful. And I think by luck, we've hit upon something as a way of getting people engaged, because people are not I mean, Glasgow's got a reputation of being lazy. Well, that's, that's unfair. It's not that they're inherently lazy or it's a genetic type or something. It's that they don't have the opportunities or the space to be physically active enough. A lot of space has been taken away that used to be community space or green space. But given the chance, you know, we've got a kilometre of track there that people just go around on their bikes. And that opportunity, you know, shows that the principle, build it and they will come, is true. Because it's there and they come in the thousands, literally thousands of people come along. And that includes disabled and excluded and isolated people. And people have li little opportunity otherwise to enjoy fresh air and exercise in, in the outdoors. So that makes me think, you know, there's grounds for optimism. If the facilities exist and they're good facilities and you kind of you know, you tick a box, and it lights something up in someone's brain, right? and it responds to a, a need for society and for community, for physical enjoyment. Uh, people love turning around on bikes and having fun, so if you can tap into that energy, and it is there, that latent energy, and you've cracked it, because people want to be with people, <laughs> whatever you know, dispute there might be about what human nature consists of, people want to be with people, People don't want to be isolated, so give them the chance, you know, pour into a space that's provided. <laughs> so, uh, you know, there's a lot of, you know, psychological illness and mental illness, depression, uh, and a whole range of, you know, mental health problems. It greatly helped by overcoming the isolation. It's a primary cause in that. So what's the most important thing you think you'd like to share with people? I think and the most important thing to share is that public space, common good space, you know, is available now. You should take advantage of whatever public common space already exists. And by getting involved in those active spaces, you inevitably create an impetus towards creating more community 
active space. So, you know, I had about a project just on the radio yesterday. Just overheard something. Oh, I must look it up, find out exactly what it's about. It's some project. I think it was uh, somewhere in the, on the south coast of England where they had a, a street day. I mean, we have street days here, like Gibson Street Gala. We, for a day, we, we close down the street and we open the street to people, a, a fair and markets and so on. But this was a, a very simple idea. On this day, just take a chair or a couple of chairs from your house, take them outside, put them on the street and sit down and, you know, and try and get other members of the community to do the same thing. So I'm telling people, come out of the you know, isolation come out onto the street, you know, it could be an organised event or it could be completely spontaneous and just take over the street, you know, and remember that streets were for this for thousands of years until about 1960, 1970, when, you know, street life was abolished by the auto industry. So, they had, you know, get together. I mean, well, as far as I'm concerned, the fact that we own the 80s, the end of the line, Using the land and taking ownership, yeah. collective ownership of these places. Yeah. I mean, gentrification is probably the biggest evil that's happening, and you can put all the problems together. And there wouldn't even add up to gentrification. That steam would overcome, because as soon as you disconnect people from their land, you can do anything you want with them. That's that's what can they do? You know, they're detached from their place. Yeah. Yeah, people are separated from each other and from the environment. So what's your vision for going forward then? Well, I've got a vision. You know, it's got several layers. You know, with Free Will North, a charity, I've got a vision of this White House building being a, perhaps, you know, I hope that sh during 2016 it will really flourish into a, a thriving, active so community this, this centre. This is a whole new project. This is yeah. brand new, this building. Yeah. And uh, it didn't just out of the sky. No. It's taken a lot of effort. A lot of time. Years and years. Uh, yeah. Picking away and picking away yeah. and picking away. Well, it's 2016 now, and I, you know, I first put this project into Free Will North's business plan in 2008, and even before that, I had my eye on it, because this location and its historical significance in Mary Hill uh, couldn't be better. You know, it's Mary Hill's oldest building. It's got tremendous significance for the community and people who live in the area, including me. I live in this area, you know, so this is like an icon of Mary Hill. And it goes back to 1810 when it was built and it was, you know, uh, it was a, a shop for people who worked on the canal. It's been a post office, it's been a pub and people have lived in it and people who come through the door, you know, regale us with I stories. Think, I think what people do understand you know what will happen is this place will be brilliant and in the summertime there'll be bikes out there yeah. and people will be going this is amazing I'm going up here to yeah. coffee or coffee. Well we've got I just knew yeah. that's going to happen. Yeah. You know and we're thinking why didn't it happen ten years ago? Yeah. Why did you this is a bit this is this idea about well I suppose we're only going to mention the council and stuff like that. But we'll try everything. But the right idea the right idea is always the last thing you should be attempt. Yeah. And you're kind of thinking, there's so many people who just give up. They yeah. Realise this is a slow burner. This is you have to just keep there and nab away, and eventually you get fed up and you get what you want. And there's so many people put so much energy into things and kind of end up burning up before they achieve what they're doing, and then sometimes you get a little bit bitter and you get a wee bit of this and that the next thing. So it's it's that experience. But how do you keep at it? Yeah. Well, that's true. You know, the one thing you've got to have in this game, developing a project, is tenacity. I mean, forget all the others. <laughs> you know, this tenacity and, you know, persistence are worth more than all the other characteristics put together. I mean, you can be a great business developer, uh, you can be a genius at financial control, and you can be great at all the bureaucracy of running a charity. But you know, unless you've got uh, persistence and tenacity, you're not going to make it because you'll find so many discouraging obstacles along the way and they'll just grind you down unless you just just keep battering through them. And this is a case in point, I've been after this building for eight years 
got it now, and now we've got this uh, great plan developing. We've been helped by Scottish Canals and Sustrans and the council to put together a really important community project that will really get people physically active, because that's what people need and enjoy physical activity. If we link that to the cafe, we'll have a beautiful cafe here. We're going to change this building physically so that the windows facing the canal and the sun that comes in from the south, you'll be able to sit out with your coffee in the summer. Uh, on Sustrans Route 754, you'll be able to watch the boats going past. There might be kayaks and boat rides going on and uh, all the different kinds of cycles going past that, that we use in our project. So it's not just mountain bikes, have tricycles and bikes for two and bikes for three, disabled cycling. You'll be able to come in here, enjoy your coffee, and look at all the information. It's going to be a cycling information hub. So everything you need to know about cycling in Glasgow, all the different projects will be collated here. And there'll be also information on cycle design cities throughout the world. So we'll have a library of information about how cycling is done in the best places, Copenhagen and so on. The big video screen showing how people actually move about in well-designed cities and spaces. So it's going to be a really great place for people to come. And everything in between. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Well, my last question was, what gives you hope? I think, I think you've just answered that. Yeah, well, what gives me hope is that many people are singing from the hit same hymn sheet as we are. I was at Glasgow University yesterday. I had a great meeting with them because we're uh, recruiting for a research intern at the moment. And that person will really help us, you know, Old people like me and you, Bob, our brains can't understand the internet. <laughs> you know, the technicalities of it, and navigating your way through social media and all the, you know, all the web computerization now. Yeah, well, that's true, but it, I find it difficult. So we're recruiting a, a student from the university to really help us take this forward to really, you know, raise our profile on social media and on the internet. So. But I was talking to the lady who recruits the students from the university to internships and uh, she was saying in the last 10 years there's been a total change in the ethos and culture of students whereas about the year 2000 it was still everyone wanted to be in finance and business and marketing and stuff like that and just to make lots of money but in the past few years that's all changed now students are very interested in the big questions like global warming and health and social cohesion, and uh, there's been a complete switch, which yeah. gives me hope. I suppose it's it's going to hit us an imperative. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> you can't get on about this yeah. stuff anymore. It must change. Yeah. But the interesting thing is, it all comes to the odd places. I mean, Glasgow City Council are now talking about creating cooperatives and they're talking about democracy and uh, solidarity and isolation and you know, all this kind of stuff. But it's ironic that they're coming up with these <laughs> ideas. This is what we should be coming up with. Yeah. And people should be saying, you know, but the fortunate thing is they don't know how to run a cooperative and we do. You know, so whatever their idea is about running a cooperative, I don't know, but there's a brilliant opportunity to fill a big space there. It's called cooperatives, which could be pretty good. Yeah. You know, and, and just ignore mm. the rest of it and just... Yeah, and that's true. Or whatever, you know, that cooperatives are a, you know interesting way forward. And I think they're reflected in the new social media as well. Because it may, the power of the internet is that we can kind of circumvent conventional authority structures, mm -hmm. just do things for ourselves. And, you know, micro projects are emerging all over the world, whether it's people growing their own food or using uh, their own land to do what they want into alternative energy. So it used to be the case that people had to go through governments or local authorities to get anything. But now people are finding cooperatively through common good ide ideology and philosophy, they can do things for themselves. Thanks for your time. No problem, Bob. I enjoyed it.